Our scripture reading for the 14th Sunday after Pentecost is found in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Now he, meaning Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. Here ends the word of God for the people of God. Eighteen years. How long is that, really? I suspect it's different depending on where we are in life. At the beginning of the summer, we had a whole bunch of elementary school age kids running around this sanctuary in the education building at Vacation Bible School. And you know what? For them, 18 is way in the future. That was more than twice the lifespan of most of those kids. We took some of the junior high kids on SSP this summer, and they're getting closer, but for junior high school kids, 18 is still half again the time they've lived in the future. It feels like a long, long way to them. Even our high school students, the very oldest, are just turning 18 now, and they feel like they've been here for quite a while, I think. We could look at the other end of life spectrum. Those of you that qualify for our Club 90 because you've lived that long, it's about 20% of your lifetime. Now, I think as we get older, we all feel like years go by really quickly, and some of us might say 18 years just goes by in a flash, but 20% of the lifetime of a 90-year-old person is a significant chunk of time. And that's how long this woman has been walking around like this. I've got to tell you, it doesn't feel very good. Try it sometime to bend over like that. It starts to hurt. 18 years she's been that way. In the story now, Jesus is in a synagogue. It says he's teaching in one of the synagogues. It's not specific about where he is, but he's not in his home synagogue. He, he is not at home. He is often on the road, and he's on his way to Jerusalem. So it says he's teaching there, but it's not his home synagogue. So I, we might think of him as sort of the guest preacher, maybe, for the day. And he sees this woman here in the house of worship, and she is bent over like that. We don't know if she even knows who he is. It doesn't say she asked him to help her. It doesn't say she even noticed him. It says that he called her to come over to him. And he said, woman, you are set free from your illness. Now, a lot of the healing stories, that's enough. Jesus just speaks a word, and that word is enough to do what he has said, and people are healed. But in this case, in addition to the words, he reaches out and he touches her, and she stands up straight. Now, you have to know, this is a really public declaration. They are in church, basically. And he's the guest, and he has healed this woman right then and there, and she stands up straight. 
When you're bent over like this, as I said to the kids, it's kind of hard to relate to other people, to get your head up to even see them. Everybody else is up here. So her problem was not just physical, it was also social. On top of that, they were in a place where you learn about who God is. And in those days, people often taught that God was punishing people that had disabilities. They must have done something wrong, and that's why they were stuck with the problem they had. And that made other people kind of anxious to be around them. You know, it, first of all, it could be contagious if you don't know much about medicine. But secondly, if God is mad at that person, maybe that wrath is going to kind of spill over on you. So people tended to stay away. And here, very publicly, Jesus not only demonstrates he can heal her, but he touches her, which heals the social part of this, too. It says, you're, you're part of this. You belong here. We are connected to one another. He brings her in. And it says she stands up straight and praises God. And I don't know about you, but when I picture what this feels like, I don't think she was quiet. I'm guessing she's causing a commotion. Think about this for a minute for yourself. We all walked in here today carrying burdens of some kind. Maybe it's a physical ailment. Maybe it's an emotional one. But we carry stuff in here. What if there's something you've been carrying for years and today it was gone? Just like that. Just gone. It's not a quiet event. I think she was probably dancing and, and singing and really excited. And certainly the leaders of the synagogue noticed what had happened to her. And they were not so happy. Think about them for a moment. I mean, it's their synagogue, right? He's the guest. He's the visitor. And now he has not only healed her when she's been coming there for 18 years and they haven't been able to do it, he's broken one of the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath is a day where you're not supposed to do work. And so they want to call him out on this. They want to get their congregation back. And so they say, they're not talking to him, they're talking to the people, hey folks, he's not allowed to do that. You have six days a week when you could come and get healed, but don't come here on the Sabbath day and expect anybody to heal you because that's work and we're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Well, it's interesting. There are two different places in the Bible that really talk about this commandment not to work. And one is in Exodus, I mean, and sorry, in Genesis. And it talks about how God created the world. He created the world in six days. And on the seventh day, God rested. And so we're supposed to rest too. That's a model for us. We're supposed to rest on the seventh day. And not just us. We're supposed to let our animals rest. They don't have to do any work. In those days, people had slaves. You were supposed to let your slaves rest. Everybody was supposed to rest on the Sabbath. So they're looking at him and going, congregation, this is a bad guy. You know, he's telling you to break the rules. Well, Jesus is reading out of a different book in the Bible. Jesus is perhaps reading out of Leviticus. Leviticus also talks about this commandment where you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. But in Leviticus, it's remembering that God brought the people out of slavery and into freedom. It was an act of justice. And the Sabbath is a time to remember that God has set people free. And so Jesus is taking the Sabbath to say, we can set this woman free right now. She has been burdened for a long time. We can let it go. We can free her. Well, you can imagine this is not playing well with the, the leaders of this congregation. Their flock is very excited. They're rejoicing with the woman. But the, the leaders are in a bad place because they have been shown up. He's freed her. He's telling the people they can break the rules. They've lost control. So it may come as no surprise to you to hear that this is the last time we hear about Jesus in a synagogue. <laughs> Nobody wants to invite him to be their guest preacher when that's what he's going to do to your congregation. So the woman is happy. Most of the congregation is happy. The leaders of the synagogue, not so happy. And Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem where the people who are not happy with him are going to attempt to silence him. So 
we have to think about this a little bit because Jesus has taught the congregation and now all of us who hear about it through the Bible to know that we can break rules. He's breaking one of God's rules. And that can be scary business to say, well, we don't have to follow the rules. That can lead to chaos, right? So it's important to ask ourselves, when do we get to break the rules? When is it important, maybe, to break the rules? And when do we need to follow them? And looking at Jesus' example gives us a good model to follow. You have to ask yourself, who am I doing this for? Who am I going to help and who am I going to hurt if I break the rules? And Jesus was always about helping the people who were burdened to be set free. Breaking the rules is okay if you are helping a person who is burdened to be set free. You have to ask, is there a part of me that's doing this because I want it? You know, or is it really truly selfless? Is it about helping somebody else? Am I acting out of love? Or am I resisting breaking the rules because I am so rigidly constrained to a rule that I don't even really understand what it's there for? Because, you know, in other places in the Bible, Jesus says the Sabbath was made for people, not the other way around. People weren't made to, to serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for us. It's good for us to take a day to rest. It's good for us to have a whole day where we just really focus on God and how grateful we are for all of the things that God has given us. But Jesus says when that becomes such a rigid rule that it means you don't even notice or you won't stoop to help somebody who's struggling, you're using it wrong. It's supposed to help you, not to make you hurt somebody else. So Jesus says, you know, you break the rule when to break the rule means that you are going to really and truly help somebody else. That's hard for us sometimes to think through. It, it takes wisdom to know when is the right time. Because if, if we all decided we're not going to follow the traffic laws, we know what would happen. There would be a problem, right? And sometimes we think we're above some of those laws. You know, maybe you can't text while driving, but I'm good enough driver. I could do it. You know, we, we, we rationalize about how we do things or why we do things. But this is saying, ask yourself, are you trying to serve something in yourself? In which case, I think Jesus would say, don't break the rule. Or are you trying to help somebody else be freed from something that is holding them tight? And in that case, I think Jesus says we break the rules. So in this story and in a whole lot of other places, Jesus shows us just a glimpse of what it's like to live in the kingdom of God. He brought that here with him and taught us that we can work to make it here. We pray every Sunday that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus shows us this picture. People can be set free. In the kingdom, there is no more suffering. There is no more pain. We don't have to have rules because everybody wants to do the right thing. We are healed to that level in the kingdom. And Jesus says we can start right now. We can start treating each other and living as if we are there now. And as we live that way, we create it. And so today, as we go out, we're going to be singing a song that says, I know the Lord's laid his hands on me. It's a joyful song. It's the kind of song I imagine this woman who had been bent like this for 18 years singing when she is straightened up. She has felt that touch. And it's the kind of joy we can know when we allow ourselves to be healed of things that we've carried because we've given them up to God. It's also the kind of joy we can know when we allow ourselves to be instruments of God's healing, that we allow ourselves to follow God's urgings and notice that we can be of help to someone else. It's a joyful thing indeed when God or Jesus have laid their hands on you. And we will go out singing that in just a few moments. Amen.